Good afternoon. My name is Nancy Chaitis, and I'm a first year student here at the Kennedy School. Uh, joining me is Alexandra Chirinos, another first year student at Harvard Law School. On behalf of the members of the Latino Caucus of the Kennedy School and Alianza at Harvard Law School, I'd like to welcome you all to the first event of the eighth annual Latino Law and Public Policy Conference. We hope you'll join us tomorrow for the remainder of the conference, including panels on immigration, education, and wealth development. The goal of this conference was to bring together students from around the nation with the preeminent leaders and scholars on, on Latino issues to discuss the most pressing issues that affect our community. And this conference is testament to the fact that although we're, sm we're small, the Latino community at Harvard is strong and capable of leading the nation in recognizing the importance of Latino issues. Our speaker today is a Harvard Law School alum and living example of the power and success of Latinos at Harvard. To introduce our speaker tonight, I'm happy to present Dean David Elwood. Uh, thank you very much, Nancy. And I, I do want to uh, uh, thank Nancy Chiris and Alexander Chirinos for their work putting this together and the ex exceptional uh, activities here and dozens of other uh, students who've worked very hard on this, uh, organizing the eighth annual uh, uh, Latino Law and Public Policy Conference. This is the kind of thing that we feel very important, is very uh, important part of things, both because of the, of the public policy and the notice, the, the idea of serving the public interest, something larger than yourself, but also in the collaboration between the law school and the Kennedy School, something that I'm deeply committed to and, and care uh, quite a lot about. Uh, tonight we have someone known for his fancy dressing. Uh, he, uh, he will explain this uh, when he gets up. Uh, and uh, we've, uh, this past semester, had uh, an extraordinary range of speakers, ranging most recently from, from Newt Gingrich, 
or very recently to previously John Edwards, uh, and uh, today we have uh, Ted Cruz, who's, who's terrific. These are people that are leaders or emerging leaders, uh, thought leaders always, and uh, we're very, very fortunate to have him here today. Our guest this afternoon uh, is the son of Cuban immigrants and was raised in Texas. Now, he has had an extraordinary life, and he's done a variety of remarkable things. But like many of us, he has made a mistake uh, or two. And his first mistake is he actually went to a uh, mediocre university in Princeton, actually of the same name. Uh, and uh, of course, he was able to shine in that not so competitive environment and he was chairman of the undergraduate council and overcame the challenges of that university to become a two-time US national debating champion. Uh, you know, it's something we all have done, but nonetheless, uh, uh, it's, it's a good thing to have done. And Literally, he was the number one ranked collegiate speaker in North America. It is truly an exceptional achievement. He then corrected the error of his ways and attended Harvard Law School, um, where he was the primary editor of the Law Review and executive editor of the Harvard uh, Journal of Law and Public Policy. In addition, he was a founding editor of the Harvard Latino Law Review. Again, truly exceptional. He, be, he was graduated magna cum laude from law school in 1995 and named a James Olin Fellow in Law and Economics. Uh, after law school, he clerked for uh, Jar Judge uh, Michael Luddig in the U.S. Court of Appeals in the Fourth Circuit, and in 1996, he, he clerked for Chief Justice William Rehnquist. He's practiced constitutional and commercial litigation at Cooper Craven in Washington, D.C., served as chairman of the School Choice and Education uh, Reform Community of the Federal Society for Law and Public Policy. He's been a speaker on numerous uh, programs, uh, both in television and radio, and indeed was named one of the outstanding uh, emerging leaders by Newsweek magazine. Um, he, in 1999 to 2000, our speaker served as the domestic policy advisor to the Bush-Cheney campaign in Austin, Texas. And in November and December, he helped assemble the Bush legal team during the Florida presidential recount. Another low visibility, uh, unsuccessful attempt at legal uh, activity. Uh, in 2003, he was appointed Solicitor General of Texas and the Chief, uh, appellate, chief uh, appellate Lawyer, successfully defended the Constitution of Texas's Ten Commandments Monument before the Fifth Circuit, and authored the U.S. Supreme Court brief defending the words under God in the Pledge of Allegiance. This is a man of remarkable ideas, thoughts, and leadership. Please welcome Ted Cruz. By the way, I failed to mention that he's the Solicitor General of Texas, another, so thank you so much. Thank you, Dean, I appreciate that very generous introduction. Uh, good afternoon, I appreciate everyone being here today. Let me begin by apologizing for my attire. I've had the joy of spending the last three hours at Logan Airport uh, in endeavoring to use all of my lawyerly skills acquired here at Harvard to try to find my luggage. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I don't mean to diminish the, the sake of your Harvard education, but it didn't do one bit of good. Uh, Continental, luggage assure, Continental Airlines assures me that somewhere on this planet my luggage is, but it is not here in Boston with me. Uh, I, I, I wish I could say that this were, was a deliberate step. I was trying to do kind of the Lamar Alexander thing and just, you know, go in the plaid shirt, but since it didn't seem to work too well for him, and uh, I, I can't claim that was the plan. <laughs> but I'm very glad to be with you here today. These are, in my judgment, tremendous times, and they are tremendous times for the Hispanic community. All of us in America right now the Hispanic community is thriving and rising as we never have before. If you look across this, this country, if you look at the Attorney General of the United States, Alberto Gonzalez, a man who is seventh in the line of succession to the presidency, his parents were migrant workers uh, in, in a small town in Texas, in, in humble Texas. If you look at the Secretary of Commerce, if you look, we now have two members of the United States Senate from Colorado and from Florida. We have a governor, a state attorney general. We have members of Congress, state officials, movie stars, TV stars, athletes. The Hispanic community is rising. And these are exciting times. Now, it's obvious to all of us that we as a community are not monolithic. We're not simply, check this box, here is your Hispanic, fill in the blank. 
We are collectively for many peoples. We're Mexican Americans, we're Cuban Americans, Puerto Ricans, Dominicans, Central South Americans. We're Republicans, we're Democrats. But the Hispanic community, I think, is tied by many common bonds, is tied together by faith and family. Anyone who's ever had a dinner in an Hispanic household, who's seen an abuela, mine had a remarkable chancleta, which she could hit you at 20 yards from. Whatever you were doing without looking, she just whoosh, bah! That's part of who we are, a love for family, a love for community. One of the things that I think shapes the Hispanic community in the United States is that we are all ourselves or our parents or our grandparents immigrants, Americans by choice. It's a phrase the president likes to use. And I think it captures a lot of the spirit of the Hispanic community. We're here because we want to be or because our parents or grandparents said, this is where we will make our home. And that knits us together. Now, I want to talk about three broad points and then just open it up to questions and discuss whatever y'all want to discuss. The first point is simple, but I think profound. You can do anything. That's something a lot of people forget. They think, well, if I try something, there might be a risk. I might not get there. The people in this room, you can do anything. There is no limit. I'd like to share a story with you, a story of, of my personal hero, my dad. My dad was born in Matanzas, Cuba. He grew up there, and when he was 14, he got involved in the Cuban Revolution and began fighting with Fidel Castro in the revolution. He was 14 years old at the time. And at the time, that's most of who was in the revolution, were young boys, as my dad puts it now, kids who were too dumb to know any better, that were fighting against a very cruel dictator. And so he spent three years fighting in the revolution, including at one point being put in front of a firing squad until he was pulled out at the last moment. And then when he was 17, he was a freshman at the University of Havana, and he was captured by Batista's police, and he was thrown in prison. My grandparents didn't know where he was. He disappeared, and they knew that he was in the, in the underground. And so if you were doing that, and he had been blowing up buildings, he'd been throwing Molotov cocktails, he had been fighting a revolution. So my grandfather began looking for him. He began going from jail to jail searching for him. A week later, he found him in a jail about 50 miles out of town. And he had been imprisoned and tortured uh, and, and beaten nearly to death. And my grandfather, he bribed his way out of prison. And he said, at that point, get out of the country. They know who you are now. They're just going to kill you. So my dad applied to three universities. He applied to University of Miami, LSU, and University of Texas. UT was the first one to let him in. And so in 1957, my dad arrived on an airplane in Austin, Texas. He was 17 years old. He had nothing. He was wearing a suit. He actually had more than I had. He had the suit on his back. <laughs> and he had a slide rule in his pocket. He had $100 sewn in his underwear that his mom had put there so they wouldn't take it from him at the border. He knew nobody. And he didn't speak a word of English, but he had directions to the University of Texas. So he went, he found a place to live. That was the first priority. He rented an apartment. That $100 came in handy. And he got a job as a dishwasher, making 50 cents an hour. And he went to school full time at UT, and he worked full time. And he actually, he worked seven days a week. And the reason for it was simple. He got a job as a dishwasher and eventually as a cook. And the reason he wanted to work at a restaurant because you could eat while you were working. And so he worked seven days a week because the only time he ate was when he was at working. And if he didn't work that day, he didn't eat. And from there, 
He went through UT, he built a business, and I was raised in Texas. That experience, that's a story many of us in this room could tell. It's a story somewhere, be it us or our parents or our grandparents, somewhere someone took a risk to come here. Somewhere in all of our history, someone said, I don't care what the peril is. I don't care what the risk is. I want a better future for my kids. I want the promise of freedom and opportunity that America provides. If you see yourself facing limits, if you see yourself thinking it can't be done, if you look at something and say it's impossible, let me suggest to think that you think of one of my favorite movies, The Princess Bride. Inconceivable! You keep on using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. If you in your life are facing something that seems inconceivable, remember Inigo Montoya, another member of our community, uh, and a fine swordsman, I might add, who made a delightful Dread Private Roberts. If you aim for the stars, if you don't believe anything is impossible, you might surprise yourself and find that nothing is. One of the great things coming out of this institution is that you really can have a tremendous number of op op options open to you. And through working incredibly hard and then just putting yourself in a position to get lucky, which is an awful lot of life, is that there's some luck in it, but there's a lot to be said about busting your tail to get somewhere where you can then get lucky tell you a story from the mid-80s uh, about two judges in the D.C. Circuit. As you all know, in the, the mid-80s, Robert Bork and Antonin Scalia were both on the D.C. Circuit. And at the time, everybody knew that they were the two conservative superstars on the appellate bench. So one or the other was very likely to go up to the Supreme Court. No one knew who. It was kind of the widely acknowledged rivalry between Scalia and Bork. Well, Scalia was in the D.C. Circuit, and he's in the parking garage, and he's walking up to the elevator. And there are two U.S. Marshals standing at the elevator that stop him. And they say, I'm sorry, we're holding the elevator for the Attorney General of the United States. Well, Scalia, no shy wallflower, he pushes through them, steps in the elevator and jams the button. And as the door is closing, he looks out and says, you tell Ed Meese, Bob Bork doesn't wait for anyone. <laughs> That's a true story. And who knows? That may have explained in 1986 why he got the nod. So luck's part of it. But there's an awful lot you can do to put yourself in a position to get lucky. The second point I'd make is to say, do something. If you can do anything, do something. And in particular, make a difference. It is very easy, coming out of Harvard, to go and get a great job, make some money, drive a fancy car, live in a big house. If you want that, all of that is there for the taking. Let me suggest to you that that is not the answer. In the end of the day, piling more and more money in your bank account is not the key to a rewarding life. Make a difference. Now, how do you make a difference? That I can't tell you, because what I would say is look for your passions. Look to yourself and ask, what do I care about? Not what's okay, but what gets me up in the morning? What do I want to go and wake up every day and go and fight for? And whatever your passions are, don't accept with complacency that you're not going to go for your passions. You're just going to go for the big paycheck. 
Because I'll tell you, being a few years out of here now, I have lots of friends who are classmates who had passions, they just don't remember what they are. And they're off earning a paycheck instead. It's not to say earning a paycheck isn't good, but fight for your passions. And let me suggest in particular, make a difference in people's lives. In my life, one of the critical turning points was in 1999, in the middle of the summer. I was at this, that point, a young associate at a law firm in DC, was making you know, more money than I thought existed. And the opportunity came to come and work for the George W. Bush campaign. Uh, my home state governor was running for president, and I had been a big fan for a long time. That was an interesting decision. Uh, I was offered the job of domestic policy advisor, and within two weeks, literally, had to wrap up my practice of law, sell my house, pack up everything I own, and move from D.C. back to Austin. In one day, that job involved literally an 80% pay cut. And I guarantee you, when you take an 80% pay cut, it gets your attention. For a year and a half, my net income after expenses was about negative two grand a month. Just fixed expenses were more than I was making on the campaign, and so I lived off savings. Fortunately, the, the couple of years I'd been in a law firm, I'd saved about half of what I made. And so I just sold stocks. And the decision point there came, it said, okay, you know, you have ideas you care about. You're always glad at the local bar to spout off your ideas on, you know, the country's going to hell in a handbasket. It's time to put up or shut up. You know, in my life, it was if you're going to say what we should be doing, if you're going to say the direction the country is going in is or isn't making sense, are you willing to get out there and put some skin in the game? Or are you just going to kind of sit by the water cooler and spout off some more? I cannot overstate how glad I am to have made that decision. It's a major fork in the road to go down, spend a year and a half fighting on a presidential campaign, which is one of the most exhausting things you can ever do. It is 20 hours a day. I met my wife on the campaign. It's actually one of the interesting things. The Bush campaign in 2000, we had, uh, I think it was eight marriages come out of the campaign. Um, so I have always said, the critics notwithstanding, it's, it is hard to dispute that the president is a uniter, not a divider. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, at least in our household, that, that was certainly true. A year and a half fighting every day where literally we woke up and said, from our perspective, we were fighting for America. That's exciting. That, you realize why you're doing it. You're doing it to make a difference. From there, as the dean mentioned, I went down to Florida for 36 days. Uh, I think I'll go to my grave with that being the most surreal legal experience of my life. But again, an extraordinary battle where you were fighting for what you believed in. In the 10 years since I have been out of Harvard Law School, I've had eight government jobs, uh, which both my mother and wife point out means I cannot hold a job to save my life. But one of the real privileges of public service. They're downsides, mind you. In the 10 years, I still have school loans. So does my wife, who went to the B school. We both still, Harvard reminds us every month of our time here in Cambridge. And our classmates have long forgotten school loans because they've taken different paths. But they're real rewards to public service also. You know, I think about when I was at the Department of Justice after the 2000 election. One of the things I got to do there is I went over to Europe, to Rome, to lead the U.S. delegation negotiating the Council of Europe's International Treaty on Cybercrime. That is rewarding stuff. After DOJ, I went to the Federal Trade Commission where I was the head of policy there. One of the things we did there is we held public hearings on barriers to the expansion of e-commerce. We looked at 10 different industries where there are barriers to expanding innovation, technology, and commerce, 
and looked at ways to tear down those barriers. That's another thing where you, where you feel good at the end of the day, that if you get some of that done, you're moving the ball forward. In this job, a solicitor general, it's an extraordinarily fun job. It's hard to imagine a better job as a litigator. In two and a half years, I have had the privilege of doing 18 oral arguments, three in the U.S. Supreme Court, have written over 30 U.S. Supreme Court briefs, and have been consistently in one big battle over another that makes a difference in the lives of Texas and the lives of everyday Texans. For example, I had the privilege in the Newdow case about two years ago, that was the United States Supreme Court case considering the Pledge of Allegiance. I had the privilege of writing a brief that was joined by all 50 states. It's actually the only brief I'm aware of in history where 50 out of 50 attorneys general have all agreed on the same proposition, which is that we all collectively, all 50 states came into the US Supreme Court and defended the Pledge of Allegiance. That's something you feel pretty good coming home and telling your mom what you did today. Also had the privilege of defending the Ten Commandments monument in the state of Texas. As many of y'all know, there's been Ten Commandments litigation all over the country. Most of the states have lost. In Texas, we've won. Federal District Court, we have a monument that has stood for over 40 years. We were sued. We prevailed in federal district court. The appeal went to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. I argued the case for Texas. We won unanimously from the Fifth Circuit. And then March 2nd, we were up in the U.S. Supreme Court. I wrote the brief, and my boss argued that case, the Attorney General. Uh, and I think we're cautiously optimistic that the Supreme Court will agree with us that our monument doesn't have to be torn down. That's something else that makes a difference, that you feel good about what you're doing. Last year, I was in front of the Texas Supreme Court defending the constitutionality of the Texas Sexual Violent Predator Civil Commitment Law, the law that allows you to take predators and pedophiles that are going after our kids and ensure that they're monitored so they can't go after our kids again. A Texas Court of Appeals has thrown that out as unconstitutional. And I had the honor of arguing in front of the Texas Supreme Court to uphold it. That's another example where you sleep really well that night. That whatever happens in these cases, I don't know if we're going to win or lose, but at a minimum, you're fighting for what you believe in. And that is extraordinarily rewarding. The third and final thing I want to say is a little bit about public policy and to suggest a direction as you're searching for your passion, as you're deciding what to fight for, to suggest a theme to consider as an organizing principle. And that is expand opportunity. In my judgment, the central organizing theme of domestic policy should be expanding opportunity. I think we as an Hispanic community have disparate interest, but collectively, there is no value that is more important than in ensuring that the United States continues to be a land of opportunity for all. And so we should look to public policy really through, to use a Harvard philosopher, a Rawlsian lens. A question about how every public policy proposal, how does it affect those at the bottom of the economic ladder? And in particular, not, I actually disagree with a lot of the proposals of those who have advocated a Rawlsian lens, in that the suggestion has been the answer is to take someone to the bottom of the economic ladder and try and move them. I don't think that works. I think those policies feel good, and I think they often fail. What I think we should be focusing on is how does somebody climb that ladder? How does somebody go, as they have from the beginning of this country, from a penniless immigrant up the ladder of success? How does a mother or father climb the ladder of success and provide his or her children a better future for tomorrow? And so, 
I would suggest that domestic policy can be consistently and carefully analyzed using that rubric. Last summer, I wrote a book chapter in a book that came out in the fall of last year that was called Thank You, President Bush. And it had all sorts of chapters by lots of big notables, the vice president, about a half dozen cabinet members, and then some much smaller flunkies like me. My chapter was called The Rise of Opportunity Conservatism. And it argued for a distinctive way of viewing domestic policy, which is exactly the view I'm articulating here today. A view that focuses with a laser focus on how does a policy, does it help people ascend the economic ladder, or does it hinder doing so? In my judgment, the two pieces of public policy that have the greatest salience for expanding opportunity the two most important domestic policy issues in the country today are, first of all, school choice. This is an issue I've been active in for a decade. And in my judgment, it is about asking what will make a difference in the schools where so many children are trapped today. It's a basic question of competition. If one thinks about it, the 1970s, the 1980s, did it help or hurt the quality of American cars when Toyota began selling their cars? Competition in cars worked tremendously well. One of the interesting things about school choice, and one of the things I think about every issue of public policy, is that it should be analyzed based on the data of what works and what doesn't work. School choice is something that has been studied over and over and over again. When I was at the Federal Trade Commission, my, de my deputy, who was a PhD economist, did a rigorous study of school choice asking, what is the effect not on the students that go and use a voucher? Because the data is overwhelming that the students that actually use the voucher get a tremendously better option. But what is the effect on the students left behind? Because that's, that's the public policy criticism used for school choice, is it will destroy the public schools. And so we said, all right, let's take this seriously. Let's treat this as a serious argument of public policy. Let's look to the data and see if it's right. And so the study began by analyzing three different industries. They generalized it, as economists do. And they said, the question is, what happens in a regulated monopoly? when competition is introduced. And in particular, what happens to quality for the customers who remain with the incumbent provider, for the customers that do not go to the new entrant. So the study, first of all, looked at three different industries. It looked at airlines, telecom, and surface freight transportation, both rail and trucking. All of them had been heavily regulated near monopolies. All of them had had competition introduced. And all of them had rich data available. And so they looked at the data, and in all of them, focusing just on the customer who never moves, never leaves the incumbent provider, in all of them, the data showed a marked increase in quality as a direct response to competition. So then they said, well, well maybe education's different. Maybe education works for some reason differently than these other industries. So they looked at the data for every single instance where school choice has been tried. And overwhelmingly, the data show that the effect on the public schools, what school choice is all about is about the public schools, because it's where our kids are, that the effect on the public schools of competition is increasing quality. If you ask, what are the problems the Hispanic community is facing today, I would suggest to you the single biggest problem is the educational situation in K through 12 in this country is in many ways a travesty. And we should be horrified. Most of the people in this room were fortunate. We went to schools where you could be safe, where you could learn, where you could excel. But there has been generation after generation of kids trapped in failing schools with tremendous dropout rates, with tremendous crime rates, where the kids aren't learning. And they are doomed 
as each generation comes along to face that same future. We should be outraged by that. Now, the rest of the answers in the public policy sphere, give them some more money, you know, give them some more money. Those answers are all fine. And we've been hearing them for 40 years. This is a problem that we have faced for four decades. And I would suggest that our community should stop taking more of the same for the answer. We shouldn't be willing to let one more generation of kids go by. Education is fundamental to every other social issue. It is fundamental to poverty, it is fundamental to health, it is fundamental to crime. If our kids can get educated, those other problems will take care of themselves. And if our kids can't get educated, those problems will take care of themselves as well. That's one issue I would suggest has the potential for radical transformational change. The second issue that I think is, as a long-term matter, equally important for the Hispanic community is social security reform, and in particular, private accounts. Now, why is that? And let me ask you, why is that from the perspective of opportunity? Because at the beginning, that's what I suggested should be the measure for every reform. Daniel Patrick Moynihan, the late Democratic senator from the state of New York, described Social Security private accounts as the final culmination of FDR's New Deal. It is an estate for every bellman, as he put it. The power of Social Security private accounts is right now an immigrant can come to this country, work his or whole, her whole life as a menial laborer, mowing lawns, cleaning houses, pay into Social Security, get benefits for a few years, and then die. And nothing's left. In contrast, if you had a system that allowed that same menial worker, that same immigrant, to, in addition to receiving a Social Security check, to pay into a private account and over the course of years build up an account of $100,000, $200,000. And the numbers with a very conservative rate of return show that. That means that same individual, that same immigrant can mow lawns, can receive some benefits, but when he or she dies, their kids get an inheritance of hundred grand. Think what that means for opportunity. Think what that means for that child, that next generation, that gets to stand on the shoulders of what their parents have done. That's money for that child to go to college. That's money to buy a house, money to start a business. And that enables that next child to jump three or four rungs up on the economic ladder. This is an issue that is demagogued like crazy. But let me suggest to you, the Rockefellers don't give a flip about Social Security private accounts. It's not a problem for them. Their kids are going to get their inheritance. The power of an issue like Social Security private accounts, it is, it, it is a tremendous wealth transfer to those at the bottom of the economic ladder. But it does so in a way that it respects individual responsibility choice and ownership. It's what I like to call a paradigm shifting policy. Like school choice, both of those represent tens of billions of dollars going to individuals at the bottom of the economic ladder focused on how are we going to help them climb. Those are the sorts of policies, at least from my perspective, I think will make the biggest difference in the everyday lives of Hispanics throughout the country. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, as is our <coughs> um, style, we have time for questions. We have two microphones today, one here and one over here. Um, just a couple of uh, uh, suggestions. The first thing is, uh, 
a good important feature of question is they start with an introduction, uh, explanation of who you are. Uh, not in detail, just your name and affiliation. Second of all, they tend to be short. And third, they end with a question mark. Now, also in keeping with the Princess Bride, if you have six fingers, do not ask a question. <laughs> right over here. Good afternoon, Mr. Cruz. Uh, my name is Trina Fabre. I'm an MPP2 here at the Kennedy School mm -hmm. and a former teacher from the Los Angeles Unified School District. I have a question about the data or the studies that you were referencing with regard to school choice and how it can affect um, Latinos in education. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, First, what specific studies are you citing? Because the most recent data I've seen is that the positive effects of school choice are demonstrated for African American students and not for Latinos. Um, there's data from New York that shows this. There's data from Florida that shows this. And if those data are correct in that there isn't conclusive evidence that school choice does benefit Latino student populations, what do you propose that parents do and that teachers do to address this problem, because if that's not going to be a solution for the kids, we need to find another way. I, you, you're right that there is a, are a wide range of, uh, of, of data. The, the particular report I was talking about was something that was published in the Texas Review of Law and Politics uh, by uh, an individual named Do Dr. Jerry Ellig, uh, which, which reviewed a, a series. That, that's the one that looked at all the different industries and then also looked at a, a, a series of empirical studies on school choice. Let, let me, though, start by saying something that, that I think is really important, which is, uh, which gets lost a lot of times in the, in the school choice debate. Those that are looking for more dramatic solutions to the problem of education, uh, I don't think are or should be seen uh, as, as doing anything but celebrating teachers. And so, so I want to say, I mean, you said you were a teacher. I want to say thank you for that, because that, that is doing exactly what we're talking about, making a, lot, a difference in the lives of kids. And so from my perspective, there are a lot of teachers out there who, who are individual heroes fighting to make a, lot, a difference in the lives of kids. But the system as a whole for a lot of kids is failing them. And so from my perspective, I'm willing to try an awful lot of things. Uh, I'm willing to try whatever it will take to fix the problem. A and at least as an individual, what I'm tired of is more of the same. Uh, I, I think for four decades, our community has been told, you know, if we just had a few more dollars. Um, in DC, the public school system spends over $10,000 a student. Uh, in the city of Cleveland, one of the first cities that did school choice, one of the things that really drove the institution of a school choice program was that an entering freshman in the Cleveland public schools was more likely, statistically, to be a victim of violent crime at school than he or she was to graduate on time in four years. That's a horrifying statistic. And so with respect to school choice, I would encourage you, I would encourage everyone to look at the data and to look at it carefully for examining what works. But more importantly than that, I would encourage everyone to say, we need to try anything we can to save these kids. We shouldn't accept any solution that says this generation we can't save. Let's aim for something 10 or 20 years down the road. And so let me suggest that passion is a, is a passion that I think is well focused. Great, right here. Hi, my name is Josh Potashnik. I'm a sophomore at Harvard College. And actually, the last time I flew on Continental, they lost my luggage also. So maybe there's a pattern there. Did, did you ever get it back? I did. <laughs> yeah. Um, you mentioned that there are a lot of days when you go home and you sleep well because you feel like you've you know, done something good as Solicitor General. My question is, um, are there any days on the opposite end of the spectrum when you go home and you're not happy about what you've done? And I know around Harvard a lot of people would cite the Lawrence case, an example of that. I don't know to what extent you were involved with that. But could you talk about that case or any other case where you've gone home and you feel like, you know, I did my job, but I don't really agree with 
this policy and how you reconcile that with your job as a lawyer? You know, there is an aspect of that, particularly in practicing law. Uh, when, you, when you practice law, you represent a client, and sometimes you agree with your client, sometimes you don't. Um, and, and to some extent, that simply goes with the professional territory of being an attorney. Uh, that being said, I think I, I have been very fortunate in that as a public official, you have some ability also to help frame the policy decisions at issue. And so in the vast majority of cases, at, at least representing Texas, I have been very comfortable with the position we were litigating. With respect to Lawrence, that actually was not my office that did that. That was the Harris County District Attorney's Office. And so the Attorney General's Office, where I work, actually had no involvement at all in the Lawrence case. It came straight out of Harris County. But, you know, there are times, for example, a case just, just last month, I argued a case uh, in front of the U.S. Supreme Court that was a, a capital case, a case called Medellin versus Dretke. Uh, which, which arose from a really horrific crime in Houston where these two teenage girls unwittingly stumbled into a gang initiation and, and six gang members gang raped and murdered these two 14 and 16 year old girls. And it was about 10 years ago in Houston it was, and it's still one of the crimes that even in a city with as much crime as Houston shocked the conscience of the city. The issue in this case is a case that's gotten a lot of public attention is uh, one of the individuals, Jose Medellin, uh, was born in Mexico. He lived pretty much his whole life in the US, but he was born in Mexico. And he was not notified at the time that he was entitled to contact his consulate. And last year, the International Court of Justice, the World Court, ordered the United States to reconsider the convictions and death sentences of 51 Mexican nationals on death row throughout the United States. Uh, and this case, Medellin versus Dretke, is the first case the US Supreme Court has had since that decision trying to figure out what to do with the International Court of Justice decision. Now, in that situation, we argued, and I very strongly agree, that the International Court of Justice does not have the authority to set aside US law, and in particular, a binding decision of the US Supreme Court and a statute passed by Congress. And so what, what I argued for Texas, and I happen to agree quite forcefully with, is that no foreign tribunal can supersede the constitutional authority that is given to the US Supreme Court and the Congress to determine what American law is. And I also very much agree that this particular individual, I've seen a lot of capital cases and, and, and even on the range of capital cases, what, what this individual did that, to those two little girls is just horrifying. But in contrast, there was another individual who was on death row in Texas uh, who was convicted for arson and murder. And we looked at the case on federal habeas where a federal habeas court had, had ordered him released. Uh, and it made it to my desk. I looked at the evidence myself and I spent a lot of time looking at it. And at the end of the day, I wasn't convinced there was the evidence there that this guy did it. And so we made the decision, we're not going to appeal that. What we actually did is we brought in an independent arson investigator. And we asked him to review the evidence, look over and see what's there. And the report came back to us that, that there were significant doubts. And so that individual went free. That's one of the advantages of public service is that you don't have to just kind of blindly represent the client. You have some ability to try to do the right thing. And that's what, what you try to do in this job. But that being said, there, there is always a risk of not agreeing with everything your client does. As a lawyer, you represent them. And if it reaches a certain threshold, uh, you know, there, there comes a point where you have to step back. But I think that threshold is pretty high as a lawyer. Thanks. Right over here. Hello, Mr. Cruz. My name is Juscelino Colares. I'm an attorney with Dewey Ballantyne in Washington, DC. I uh, commend you for uh, mentioning the issue of Social Security. Uh, it is indeed a, a very uh, important issue for, I, I believe, for the Hispanic community in particular. Uh, however, I, uh, I normally uh, see that uh, in the debate, in the current debate on Social uh, Security, uh, you don't hear people discussing about the, the most important issue of the transition costs. How are you going to finance that? And basically, the, the choices are two. You either uh, issue debt, which is a tremendous transfer of wealth 
from the future generations of Latinos and other Americans uh, to the present generations, and or you uh, tax people more. And given the current political climate in Washington, in the country as a whole, uh, is very doubtful. I would like to, I mean, being in favor, in principle, of the idea of, of, of private accounts, I would like to hear from you if you have uh, your views on uh, how would you uh, deal with, uh, with this? Which way would you go? Would you issue debt? And in that case, how would you justify uh, uh, that intergenerational conflict? Or uh, would you uh, increase taxes at, at present? Thank you. I, the transition costs, I think, are, are, are a serious public policy challenge. Um, one of the problems with, with Social Security reform, and, and I think with a lot of public policy issues, is that it is hard to have a reasoned debate about the public policy impact because it gets obscured in, in extreme rhetoric on, on both sides. Uh, and, I, and I think the transition costs are a challenge. I think one thing that I would suggest is that whatever we do, whether we move towards private accounts or don't move towards private accounts, our kids are going to be faced with a massive liability. Because the status quo right now is that the system is headed towards insolvency. And so right now, our kids are going to be faced with paying for our parents and our retirement in a system where the number of wage earners compared to the number of retirees is turning upside down. And it used to be that there were many more wage earners than retirees when the system was started, and it is in the process of inverting. And so, I mean, one of the reasons why there is a lot of fervor for Social Security private accounts is because right now the government, the functional return you and I get on our Social Security is less than 2%. If you sit down and do the actuarial tables and you say, here's what you pay in during your life, here's what you expect to get out, it's less than 2% return. So one of the reasons there's enthusiasm for private accounts is that if you can get up for the past 70 years, the, the, the stock market has averaged between 6.5% and 7.5% return. And that has been every 10-year period, including through the Great Depression. If you can bring return from 2% just up to 6%, no wild internet, you know, 200% gains, just a modest 6% gain, that covers an enormous amount of the problem. And so I would suggest whatever we do, our kids are facing the future debt. They are either facing it from transition costs or they're going to face it from the unfunded liability that the system has built in and is coming to hit them anyway. You know, let me also share a story. Social security is, is, is a difficult issue to discuss in the public sphere because it is so easily demagogued. Um, I remember, I guess, two weeks after I came down to Austin to join the Bush campaign. Uh, you know, I just showed up there. I did not previously know the president. I didn't know the other campaign staffers. So I was just kind of getting to know folks. And we were doing a meeting. I guess it was June of 99. And it was uh, in the governor's mansion. And we were sitting there, about a half dozen of us, with, with then Governor Bush. And we're trying to talk about what are the issues he wanted to run on. What were the big issues that were going to frame the center of his presidential campaign? And Social Security private accounts came up. And, you know, I remember I just, I was the new kid on the block, so I just kind of kept my mouth shut and, and listened to see what the other people said. Almost every other person in the room said, no, don't do it. And what they said is they said, this is the third rail of politics. You will get demagogued to death. They will do saturation radio ads in the state of Florida, and they will tell our, the elderly citizens, he wants to take away your Social Security. And nothing else will be heard, no matter how many times you say, as every program that has been proposed, that not one penny will change for anyone at or near retirement, that the program is only talking about our generation, those younger than retirement. Almost every person in the room told him, do not touch this issue, it will kill you. And I will never forget that, that Bush, he literally made a fist and literally pounded the table. And he said, look, I'm running for a reason. I'm not just running to hold the job. This is the right thing to do. And it's our job to explain that. 
That to me made a big impact. I was actually very proud at that point to be working on the campaign because I think that's what people should be saying in public policy and a lot of times they don't. Um, and so the transition costs are a challenge and, I, and there are lots of different proposals in terms of how to deal with them but I think any of the challenges has to be fairly compared as it rarely is in the public discourse to the unfunded liability that is also coming at our kids and the advantage of private accounts is it has the ability to overcome that unf unfunded liability. And beyond that, it has the opportunity impacts that, that I was discussing. Hi, my name is Tico Almeida. I work for Fried Frank in New York. Um, I have a follow-up question to the Lawrence question mm -hmm. in light of one of the themes of your speech, which was do something. And I'm, you stated that your office didn't represent Texas and rather allowed the district attorney to defend the law. And I'm wondering if you could explain why that happened. Was it because you thought the law was so clearly discriminatory that it didn't warrant a defense? It, it, it's actually a bit of just history in terms of how Texas is set up. Um, Texas historically was a state that, that distrusted government authority. And so when the Constitution was, was set up uh, in 1876, it disaggregated authority. And so you have, for example, my boss, the Attorney General, is independently elected. The governor has no authority over the AG. They can even be from different parties, as they often have been. And then each county has an independently elected district attorney. And my boss, the AG, has no authority over the DAs. And it is not uncommon for their, shall we say, not to be complete, complete unanimity on how to handle a particular case. The basic operation in Texas is the DAs handle cases on direct appeal. Once direct appeal is over, the AG's office takes it on habeas. So Lawrence came up on direct appeal. So we had no ability. The, the Harris County DA's office said, we want to do this. We're not interested in any discussions. And so we didn't have any. There'll be, there'll be time for just two more questions, but there'll be a reception afterwards where you can continue questioning our speaker. Right here. Hi, uh, my name is Soraima and I'm from Brownsville and I just want to say thanks for coming. Um, and I think my question is pretty simple. Uh, you spoke in, during your speech of the importance of savings in your own life and how it provided you with an opportunity to leave your job and work for President Bush. And I think one thing, um, in Texas specifically, especially in the border counties where we have such an overwhelming sense of poverty among Latino um, two-parent working families that's really providing them with an opportunity to build assets is the federal earned income tax credit in that it allows them to leverage you know, money to buy a home, open a business, send their kids to school, whatever. Um, one deficit in Texas that we're facing that other states don't have face, I guess, is that we don't have a state income tax, and because of that, we can't supplement the federal earned income tax credit on a state level. So I was just wondering, I guess, your thoughts maybe on um, the possibility of, well, there's a lot of reasons I think we need a state income tax, but for that reason specifically, in order to help low-income families leverage that. I, there, there are certainly enormous challenges, particularly along the border. And, and I think that those are challenges that, that in the public policy sphere we need to focus a lot of attention on how to expand. And I think the things you're talking about are exactly right, to expand ownership, to expand, uh, for example, programs making it easier to, for individuals to uh, buy a home. One of the areas, one, one of the cases I argued in the Texas Supreme Court concerned laws governing uh, colonias, and in particular contracts for deeds where there are a lot of developers who have taken advantage of people, and so we went in defending the law in, in, in that circumstance. Um, with respect to an income tax, um, personally, I, I'm not in favor of a state income tax, uh, and, and I think it is, in the state of Texas, very unlikely uh, to pass. Uh, in, in fact, I think uh, those of you who are, who are not Texans may, may find it interesting that this particular issue for those of you that are fans of the president or those of you that are not fans of the president, this particular issue probably is a but-for cause of George W. Bush being our president uh, in that in the early 1990s, our incumbent governor, Ann Richards, uh, proposed a statewide income tax. And I remember I was in law school here at the time. And the owner of the Texas Rangers, this guy named George W. Bush, ran against her. And I remember in, in, at Harvard Law School, the idea that Ann Richards could lose was ridiculous. And I was, I was laughed at quite a bit. 
for, for suggesting that anyone would possibly vote her out of office. Uh, and she was Bush beater by a good 10 points. And, and I think the income tax was the single biggest reason she lost that, that, that election, uh, which is an interesting bit of just kind of history. With respect to the state, I think Texas has had consistently uh, one of the highest, if not the highest rate of, of all the states of businesses relocating into Texas, jobs coming into Texas, a new opportunity. And I think a lot of that is driven by the low taxes. Um, if you look at state by state, the states that are the highest taxing states are seeing their citizens leave, are losing population, are losing business, and they are all moving towards the lower taxing states. And I think there's some cause and effect there. One of the challenges in public policy is trying to figure out how to encourage opportunity, encourage ownership, but not at the same time creating such a taxing and regulatory structure in government that you, you compress and strangle the environment that is needed for jobs to flourish and for individuals to flourish. I, it is often, there are well-meaning solutions that talk about using the, the, the metaphor of the economic ladder, talk about ways to lift people up the ladder, and I think those in practice tend to be very unsuccessful. And so, so in my judgment, what we should focus on are ways to just ease the path of ascent, but it has to be, at the end of the day, the individual who's doing the climbing. That if it's not the individual responsibility of that person to change his or her life, it, it, I think, in practice is rarely effective. Be the last question. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for coming. I'm Matthew from the college. I'm a sophomore. Uh, you talked about the uh, society of opportunity and how you think that domestic policies in particular should be viewed through that lens. What do we come up with when we look at the issue of health care, uh, specifically those who aren't covered in our society, through the lens of trying to encourage those to climb up the ladder as opposed to being pulled up the ladder? Uh, for, with the goal of you know, encouraging those with that opportunity to be able to take hold of an opportunity and improve their life. Well, what specific policies uh, do you come to uh, through that perspective? Uh, you know, health care is, is an enormously complicated issue. Um, and, and, it, and it's one of the mo most difficult public policy challenges. And, and, and so I'll, I'll say something you actually hear quite rarely in public discourse, which is the, the, the most honest answer is I don't really know. Um, I think there are a lot of individual solutions we can do to help improve it. I think policy solutions that increase choice in health care are moving in the right direction. Um, I think policy solutions from a legal perspective, I mean, as a lawyer, I view a lot of things from the impact of the legal perspective. And I think there's a serious problem with the tort liability system. And so I think tort reform in the medical community can, can be a, a powerful way of decreasing costs. You look in particular at a lot of communities that are seeing obstetricians, seeing doctors in high-risk areas that are literally leaving the community so there are none left because of the levels of, of legal liability. Uh, those are solutions around the edges, around the heart of it. Uh, you know, I think we need to look at ways to expand a sense of ownership and individual responsibility among individuals uh, who have insurance. I mean, one of the difficulties is that with insurance, from an economic perspective, there's an enormous moral hazard because the individual making the medical choices is not bearing any of the uh, costs of doing so. And as a result, you end up with some very expensive procedures that are being opted for. Uh, and so I think there's value to looking, for example, to some of the programs like medical savings accounts, which enable people, it expands insurance because it drives down the cost of insurance, because it makes it, insurance more about catastrophic care. You know, if you or I, God forbid, get some horrible cancer or get in a car wreck and have, have enormous medical costs, the insurance covers that. But if, if we break our arm or, or get, a, get a disease that is more run-of-the-mill, then a medical savings account allows you to save on a tax advantage basis money that can be used for that, and then lets you make the decision about, you know, is it worth spending that additional marginal dollar? Um, those are all ideas that I think have merit and are worth exploring more, but I won't stand here and pretend to say that those necessarily will solve the problem. I think it's an incredibly 
complicated public policy problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ted Cruz, everybody. Thank you. Ted is already dressed for the party, which is about to begin behind me. I'm told there may be a mariachi band, and so please uh, join folks right after here. Thank you very much. Have a good, good week.